Okay. Um, okay, so I, I'm moving these series of amendments. The first amendment only, but we're speaking to all of the amendments. And I've seven minutes to speak to yeah, yeah. all of those amendments. Yeah. Okay. It's not a very long time to speak to multiple amendments, but anyway. Um, the purpose of these groups, the, these group of amendments, Minister, uh, are to ensure that we have proper representation of postgraduate researchers um, and that postgraduate researchers, uh, if we look at number one, will uh, be defined as, uh, as in line with the Salzburg principles. And the Salzburg principles, as I'm sure you know, Minister, uh, were a series of uh, principles that were put together by the European Association of Universities, which all our, the Irish universities are members of, uh, and which outline the importance that of, uh, to, to state, to refer to principle four, for example, uh, the doctoral candidates as early stage researchers should be recognized as professionals with commensurate rights who make a key contribution to the creation of new knowledge. Uh, now, this is the critical point here, is, as you know, the postgraduate workers' organisation who represent the postgraduate workers have been campaigning for some time to be recognised as workers, because that's what they are. Uh, and many of them live uh, in poverty, frankly, while they're doing important research, creating, to use that phrase, uh, creating new knowledge, vital knowledge for our society, for our economy, for our culture, for science, for the humanities, uh, and so on. These are workers who have lives, often have kids, have relationships, have rents to pay, have mortgage. Well, very few of them could afford a mortgage uh, because they are on such pitiful uh, incomes. Uh, they point out that even though you increase slightly the stipends for those who are uh, funded by the Research Council and SFI. It's not as high as was originally recommended and it is far below the sort of uh, the best practice in most of the rest of Europe in terms of uh, the incomes. Far below really a living income uh, and much, much less uh, than postgraduate workers and researchers get uh, in the best practice in Europe where people can get paid up to 40 and 50,000 euro. Uh, here people getting 22,000 uh, euro, uh, but that's only, by the way, let's not forget, that's only 30% of postgraduate researchers, 70% often on much, much less than that, living uh, in poverty. So they need to be treated as workers, they need to be given a living wage, uh, they need to have proper conditions uh, of employment, uh, and their representative groups and organisations, as Amendment 1 outlines, uh, need to be uh, recognised, and then subsequently, as some of the other amendments go through, need to be represented uh, on uh, the board, uh, they need to be consulted when uh, the corporate plan of the new agency has been put together. These are what my amendments are proposing. They need to, uh, when the annual plan of the agency is being put together, they need to be uh, consulted, not just the bodies that you have uh, prescribed in the bill so far. And uh, in Amendment 30, for example, I'm saying that if other bodies, companies, agencies are looking to get funding from the new research agency, uh, that uh, it has to be taken into account in deciding whether such funding is uh, forthcoming from the agency, that the agency will have due regard, I'm quoting my amendment, to the employment conditions for researchers at any applicant body when considering their application, and that the agency will make, take measures to ensure that individuals carrying out research funded by the agency are in receipt of any attendant employment rights in line with the Salzburg uh, principles. Uh, so, the intent of these is very clear, I think you would understand, Minister. 
It's about recognising uh, researchers as workers, uh, their rights to have decent employ conditions of employment uh, and to have proper representation and to be consulted in the development of the plans uh, of uh, the agency, the trajectory of the agency, uh, and so on. Uh, and I think that is the very least they deserve. And if we're serious, because often we hear government talking about the importance of research and innovation, but you look at the reality, our researchers living in poverty. It, precarious employment, not treated as employees. Uh, it's a very, very difficult, precarious, and indeed in many cases unattractive uh, option for people uh, when you consider the poverty that so many uh, researchers uh, are living, uh, living in. So I think these are very reasonable and obviously a lot of the guidance for the amendments I put forward in this regard come from the recently produced document by the per Postgraduate Workers Organisation where they give comparisons of postgraduate workers here and in the rest of Europe, they show we are far inferior in our treatment of postgraduate workers to most places across Europe, but they also cite the Salzburg principles which I've mentioned, which came from the Bologna process, but they also cite the European Charter for Researchers and the Code of Con Conduct for the Recruitment of Researchers, which clearly indicate the imperative, the imperative uh, and I haven't got time to quote it, to ensure that uh, we give decent conditions of employment, social security rights, pension rights, and so on, to our researchers so that it is an attractive, secure, sustainable environment for people to work in our universities and higher education institutions as researchers. That is not the case at the moment. If you include these amendments as part of the uh, mandate of the new research body, uh, we would take a huge step forward for research and innovation and for uh, giving decent uh, employment rights and decent incomes and decent conditions to our postgraduate researchers. Uh, for the amendments. And let me say at the outset, a number of the issues that the Deputy raised are, are, are genuine issues that I view as extremely important. Um, I will very shortly be publishing the final report of the independent external review uh, in relation to researchers, supports, career structures and others. I intend to do that this month, uh, Deputy. You'll remember we published phase one just before um, just before the budget, I think we're publishing phase two uh, this month in the month of March. I'm very happy to commit on the floor of the door that I'd, I'd recommend to government that we find space then to debate uh, that report and a number of the important issues that the deputy has raised around PhD researchers, around their, their, their terms and conditions, around their supports, around their career structures. So I want to say that by way of introduction to my comments, because it's not that I, it's not that I don't take seriously the issues the deputy raises. But obviously I am having to look at the context of the legislation uh, that is before the House. Uh, and this legislation, I suppose, is to establish the funding agency. The funding agency will not be the, the, the employer um, in many ways. The funding agency will award competitive funding, but there will be institutions involved and others. So for many of the reasons, I'd respectfully suggest that the amendments don't fit here, uh, some of them, um, and some of the points that the deputies raised. But let me just give, give, if, make a few points firstly. The quality of Irish PhD provision is underpinned, as Deputy Boy Barrett knows, by Ireland's National Framework for Doctoral Education, which in and, in and of itself is underpinned by international policies, including uh, the Salzburg principle. So I want to say that firstly. This framework has been agreed uh, in cooperation between our higher education uh, authority, the Technological Higher Education Association, the Irish Universities Association uh, and QQI. I'm very pleased that Ireland, as part of its wider proactive engagement on the European research area, participated actively in the development of the Council recommendation that was published just in December uh, on research talent and careers. And the recommendation includes a new charter for researchers replacing the previous charter and code. And I think that at a European level uh, was important progress. The Bologna process is an intergovernmental process of voluntary higher uh, education policy convergence and the Salzburg principles are basic principles that underlie further considerations on the key role of doctoral programs uh, and the training of scientific personnel within the framework of the Bologna process. One of these principles is that doctoral education must be developed by autonomous and accountable institutions and that institutions need flexible regulation to create special structures and instruments to continue advancing uh, European doctoral education. These recommendations are of course a, a set of guidelines and the Irish legislation which mentions the Bologna process in terms of the recognition, uh, sorry, the Irish legislation which mentions the Bologna process is in terms of the recognition of European qualifications. <coughs> 
In relation to this grouping of amendments, in relation to proposed amendment 31, the provisions for staff of the agency are dealt with elsewhere. This amendment, therefore, is respectfully, in my view, uh, out of context um, in relation to the provision here. HR policy in respect of researchers was formalised through the research, the researcher career development and employment framework, or the RCDEF. The RCDEF addressed the terms and conditions and the need for a defined career path for researchers that applied across the research ecosystem. The RCDF has <coughs> delivered significant benefits for researchers, including a clear and uniform salary structure and salary policy, including incremental provision, uh, uh, incremental progression and general round increases, open and transparent recruitment, clarity around career progression and professional career development and clear exit provisions. The collective bargaining function uh, on behalf of researchers is a matter for the representative bodies and their institutions or research performing organisations. It's not within the remit. Uh, of the new agency. So I can only put things in this legislation that will fall within the remit uh, of the new agency. I do want to say my department has agreed to meet with IFUT and, and other relevant unions uh, to discuss issues pertaining to researchers and, and Deputy Boy Barrett may have groups he wishes me to meet and my department to meet in that context as well. We are committed to implementing Impact 2030, which is Ireland's research and innovation strategy. A dedicated talent <coughs> pillar does highlight the crucial importance of people and talent to the Irish research and innovation ecosystem. It commits uh, to ensuring that researchers will be supported will be supported with the right skills development uh, and the right career opportunities so that they can make a maximum contribution uh, to research and innovation efforts. My department is working on this, but again, the collective bargaining aspect uh, is not within the remit of the new agency. I'm fully aware of the EU minimum wage directive and the requirement uh, that the sectoral and cross-industry level collective bargaining needs to be promoted and needs to be strengthened. This is, again, however, not something that falls in the remit of this agency because it does not belong, uh, with, therefore, with the provisions of the Bill. Amendment 12 relates to another aspect of the work of my department, which is not directly connected to the provisions of the Bill. My department did publish the first report of the Independent National Review of State Supports for PhD researchers last summer, that's the one I referenced, which at my request focused on the issue of stipend levels, and it did recommend an increase towards a a level of €25,000. We did take the first step towards that with €22,000. I accept the deputy says it's not enough, and I also want to be very clear, it's not the final word on the matter. I intend to get it to the 25000 I note a number of agencies and schools have now moved to the 25000 uh, There's a university in Dublin that have moved to 25000 There's a school in another university that has, uh, and I believe some state agencies have now also moved to that. So it's not the case. I, I think I think that 30% figure may be, may be a little out of date now, because I know a number actually did move uh, beyond the 22 and to the 25, and I do intend to continue to work to get us to that 25. I'm also very conscious, though, that it's not the only issue uh, that people raise. They do raise a number of other issues, maternity leave, paternity leave, career structures, a whole range of issues, and I do look forward to publishing uh, phase two or report two of that independent review this month. I'm very happy to have a debate either at the Oireachtas Committee uh, or here in, the, here in the Dáil in relation to that. I did secure funding in the last budget, as I've said, to increase the stipends awarded by the research uh, funders under my remit from 19,000 to 22,000 per annum, a 15.8% increase, and building on the additional funding that I secured in the previous budget as well. And my officials and I continue to engage with the budgetary process in order to continue uh, progress on, on this issue. And as I've said, the co-chair's final report will be published this month, and it does include consideration of the PhD, their status, uh, which Deputy Boy Barrett uh, has a view on and campaigns on as well. Uh, as with all elements of their work, they're taking into account the perspective of 35 stakeholder organisations. And I don't think anybody who will come across deputy who's engaged with this process can say it's been anything other than consultative and inclusive. And I do think the co-chairs objectively, and I've got that feedback from people, people who don't even agree with my political views of the world, uh, that they have found the process to be inclusive. And I hope that is the case. But these issues aren't appropriate to the work of the agency or legislation uh, in this case. Uh, the heads of bill do provide that the department with the capacity to recruit a chair of the board and the board in advance of the establishment of the new agency through an open, transparent, competency-based public appointment service. We're looking for a competency-based board and transparent recruitment process rather than a representative board. I would have discussed this at quite a bit of length with Deputy Farrell and Deputy Sherlock uh, at committee stage, so we don't have a ring fence seat for this is sectoral interest or this representative body, but instead trying to recruit a competency-based board, which will, of course, include people uh, with practical research uh, experience. So therefore, amendment number 25 is not appropriate here. I also have ran the competition for the new board and PAS are in the process of finalising uh, recommendations um, as well. So it, it, in short, uh, I'm not in a position to accept these amendments for the reasons I outlined, but very happy to engage Perfect. further. Okay. Uh, first of all, just in terms of uh, not having a representative board, I'd just like to point out that the European Research uh, Council has a different approach. Uh, it's the researchers and the scientists from all disciplines who are in the driving seat. 
and the people who you describe as with competency are told what to do by the, uh, the researchers uh, and the scientists. Okay, and that's the way it should be, in my opinion. So I disagree with you, Minister, on that, right? Um, uh, I think a research council should be driven by people who work in research and who have expertise in the different disciplines, art, science, uh, or whatever it might be, uh, that it is all about in the first place. So I res uh, respectfully disagree with you on that. And I think they should be a majority, as our amendments are proposing, uh, and uh, they should be consulted uh, with in terms of developing plans uh, and so on. Um, also, uh, I, the amendments that I put forward, for example, just to quote one, in the very short time I have, in the, ob uh, the uh, objectives of the agency, one of our amendments is that it should support the development and maintenance of high standards of working conditions across the research sector in Ireland in cooperation with rel relevant bodies, including trade unions and other representative organisations. I don't see why that isn't appropriate in this bill. That is hard wiring into the approach of the agency that it is there to promote good working conditions and uh, standards of employment for the people, something that is in line with what the European Commission and uh, all of the university associations who were involved in producing the Salzburg Principles, they have recommended this. So why is it not appropriate? To my mind, it is absolutely appropriate. In fact, it is imperative uh, that Research Council is there to promote and support and protect the interests of the researchers who actually do the research. To be very clear, it's absolutely, and again, we, we tease through this in the committee stage transcripts will show this, it's absolutely the intention that there will be researcher input into the work of the new agency. That's beyond question. And there are structures um, within the legislation, including what would effectively operate as a subcommittee of the board that will be overwhelmingly dominated uh, by people actively involved in research. There is no doubt about that. But, you know, the HSE board isn't a board made up of doctors and nurses because they work in the health service. It's made up of people who can look after the entire governance um, of significant levels of state investment. So we do have, and we would, I fully accept we have, a, we have a difference of opinion on this, but we do have, we do have competency-based boards uh, in Ireland where we advertise through uh, the public appointments process. We've done that. The, the booklet, which is there for all to see, will very clearly have outlined the range of criteria that we're looking for on the board. And that criteria will, of course, include uh, people with practical uh, research experience as well, but trying to get a balanced board that covers a whole range of competencies that would be required uh, to run a, a, a major new uh, state agency. But the legislation absolutely do, does provide for the establishment of councils, which offers another avenue in terms of researchers being able to, to input into relation to this. So there's going to be more opportunities than ever before for the research community uh, to feed in. I can absolutely assure you of that. But what we haven't done, and we get this anytime time legislation is brought forward, and it's a valid area of debate, the idea that X organisation or X group or X type of profession should have X number of seats on a board. The general approach we've taken in the last several years in Ireland uh, has been that we, in general, aren't overly prescriptive on terms of a seat for this and a seat for that, but more setting out the criteria that is needed on a board, advertising it publicly, putting it through a public appointment service, an independent process, and the names coming back from government in relation to that. On the broader issues, last King Corda, that have been raised by Deputy Boyd Barrett, and I want to say very clearly for the record again, it's not in any way to dismiss their importance. It's simply a question of the, the right vehicle in terms of this being an agency that's being established uh, as distinct from other policy matters for government around PhD stipends and the likes. Okay. Um, this okay. Is, this is the final contribution I know, on this yeah, amendment. On this grouping, yeah. Um, right, Minister. Well, I think the European Research Council has it right, and I think the government has it wrong, uh, to put it simply. And I don't think, in terms of driving the, uh, the sort of research uh, agency that we want, uh, that it should be about technocrats, for want of a better word. Right? I just don't think it should be. I, I think the technocrats should be subservient to uh, the people who are, have experience and knowledge and are engaged in the research, uh, in whatever it may be, in the arts, humanities, science, uh, or whatever. And um, indeed, I worry that you know, when you get in technocrats, 
and we'll, we'll be dealing with uh, something else later about how you specify that one person has to be on the board as somebody connected to enterprise. No mention of arts, no mention of science, no mention of humanities, but it has to be somebody from enterprise, from business, right? It worries me. Uh, so I want to see a diversity and a cross-section of people engaged in the different disciplines uh, as a dominant force, a majority force, uh, on the uh, Research Council. And finally, I simply I see the people who do the research, who create the knowledge, are the researchers. That's who does it. Everything else is meaningless without them. And our problem is they are treated pretty badly. Okay? They're living in poverty, they're living below the living wage. Uh, even with the increases you've given, they're still below the living wage uh, of 32,000 euro and far less than are some of our uh, counterparts across Europe. Uh, I think the need to create good pay and conditions and environment, employment, uh, rights and so on is critical to the success of a research agency. It's not an added on something else. I think it should be hardwired into the research agency. Uh, uh, okay, Minister. Uh, these are related, obviously, to the earlier discussion, but in a way are the most substantial ones because, well, dealing with Amendment 2 and 3 that I've put forward, um, they are seeking to include as an objective of the agency uh, that it would be to offer researchers sustainable career development systems at all career stages and to endeavour to ensure that researchers are treated as professionals and as an integral part of the institutions in which they work in line with the objectives of the European Charter for Researchers and the Code of Conduct for the recruitment of researchers. And secondly, that uh, a similar objective would be to ensure the provision of adequate funding for the development of high quality doctoral programs in line with the Salzburg principles. Uh, so just to talk to those two, I am using very deliberately wording taken from uh, the European Commission's recommendations that I have referenced there. Because they are very, very clear about the sort of conditions that researchers should enjoy if we are going to have best practice in developing uh, research and innovation. Um, and it's worth just quoting some of the things they say. Um, to develop and maintain, well, in fact, that's already quoted in the thing, that member states should endeavour to ensure that researchers enjoy adequate social security coverage. Uh, portability of pension rights, guarantee of social security rights uh, in order to maintain and advance the attractiveness of a career in research. Um, and I could quote more, but it elaborates this in great detail and in my amendments I have actually directly used the wording from the European Commission's recommendations in terms of uh, how we are supposed to support our researchers. And to my mind, that's precisely what the, one of a key objective for a research agency should be. Um, because, and of course the rationale is, is self-evident from the wording even that is used by the commission, is that if being a researcher is not an attractive option, uh, people won't do it. They won't do it, um, and it will impact negatively on research and, in, uh, and innovation. And that is the story, as I'm sure you've heard, from the testimonies of people who are postgraduate uh, researchers, is that they're always, or many of them, are on the brink of just giving it up, because it's impossible. Um, they're doing work but they're not being treated as workers, they're not given those uh, rights to holiday pay, sick pay, parental leave, uh, all the right pension entitlements and so on that they should get when they're workers. In fact, 
I mean, one of the things I think they're discussing, and if they're not, they should be discussing, is whether they are, in fact, employees de facto in law because of what they do. And I think they probably have a good case with, uh, if they took it to the WRC or the Labour Court, that they should actually be categorised, legally speaking, as employees for what they do. Uh, but they're not treated in that way, uh, and they have this very, very precarious existence. And the point I'm making, echoing what the European Commission is saying, is this is not the way to encourage uh, research. Uh, it should be the, it, we should be about guaranteeing and ensuring the best possible standards of employment, social security rights, uh, and generally making research an attractive option from an income point of view, uh, from an employment security point of view, uh, and so on. So that is the uh, logic, and I think it is entirely appropriate that they should be included as objects of the new research uh, agency. Uh, I also, uh, in this grouping, have amendments adding into the objects of the agency that it should be to promote the independence and flexibility of early uh, career researchers and to preserve and support the independence of academic and research uh, institutions. And in that regard, one of the amendments is deleting the reference to strengthening the relationship with the government and ministers of the government because we do what I believe that research should be independent. Uh, it should be uh, not linked to the political priorities of any particular government uh, or the commercial or industrial interests that may want to influence a government about what they should uh, uh, invest in in terms of research, but it should be driven by the science or the discipline uh, that uh, uh, itself, uh, in, in other words, in the best interests of science, society, humanity, rather than the interests, uh, political interests of a government or uh, the interests of uh, commercial interests. So that is uh, the logic uh, of these amendments, and I think you should accept them. I think it's in line with what the postgraduate uh, workers, representatives, organisations have asked for. It's in line with what European institutions are saying should happen and it's how, uh, how we can best advance and support uh, research. Uh, so I don't really see any reason why the Minister wouldn't accept these amendments. Deputy Sherlock. Yeah. Yeah, just okay. um, <laughs> <laughs> well, look, th th thanks very much. I certainly wouldn't answer for you, Deputy Woodward. Um, but look, a uh, co couple of things. Firstly, I just want to very briefly, uh, as the Laskin Court has suggested, return to the point Deputy Sherlock made in the last grouping, but it also brings us very much into this grouping, which is the, I, I want to be very clear, the, the, the booklet that was advertised in relation to the board vacancies, appointments to the Board of Research and Innovation Ireland, the closing date was 3 p.m. on Monday, the 23rd of October, 2023. That, that outlined very clearly what competencies we were looking for for the new board. Very specifically, the last two bullet points talking about people who had experience in relation to developing research, innovation, collaborations and partnerships of national and international scale. People talk, are talking about experience of ensuring research integrity and research ethics to the highest international standards. So I can assure you, very much outward looking, international and indeed an amendment you proposed at committee stage, Deputy Sherlock, that was perhaps superseded by an amendment I brought forward, further underpins the importance of international partnerships. And just to Deputy Boyd Barrett's point, again, I would respectfully say, and for anyone watching this debate, again, a very clear emphasis in that criteria, wanting researchers, research experience on the board as a, as a, as a competency. So I say that by way, uh, by, by way of passing, but uh, I hope to be, to, be, to be helpful. In many ways, Deputy Sherlock has made a point that I was going to make at a, at a bit of length here, which is we need to be very careful that we protect academic freedom here and that we protect the autonomous nature of our institutions. What we're doing here is setting up a a state agency, an agency of the government in terms of the dispensing of funding. And that's not unimportant, it's important, we need it and we need this new research agency. We're not in any way though having that agency supersede the, and as W. Boyer would want us to do, but supersede the, the role of the higher education authority for example, but also supersede crucially the autonomous role of individual uh, higher education institutions and their academic freedom and their, and their autonomy. I'm not suggesting that's what you want to do, but 
a lot of what you're suggesting, again, is not unimportant. It's just a question of what falls within the remit of this agency, what falls within the remit of the Higher Education Authority, what falls within the remit uh, of, individual, uh, of individual institutions. Uh, and again, I, I do think there is, I mean, there is a specific function of the new agency that does talk about you know, supporting the development of, uh, and maintenance of a national system of research and innovation. It does talk about promoting research uh, and innovation. There is in the objects of the agency clear references in relation to supporting researchers uh, and supporting the undertaking of researchers, disciplines uh, of all different disciplines uh, by researchers with different levels of knowledge. So there are clear relations to, the, there are clear outlines of the importance of protecting and promoting our researchers within both the objects and the functions of the agency, but within the constraints of what the new agency can do. So look, I do think, and as the deputy rightly acknowledged, a number of the amendments in this group, I suppose we've, we've dealt with in our back and forth on the previous group. Deputy Boyd Barrett has proposed a number of amendments here along similar themes uh, to perhaps the previous grouping. And again, I just make the point that we do need to be clear about the role of the agency and the matters that are proper either to other agencies or indeed to the higher education institutions uh, themselves, especially, as I've said, in terms of protecting that academic freedom. With regard to amendment number three, for example, funding is a matter determined by governments, by the Department of Public Expenditure Reform. The HEA and QQI are the agencies that have responsibility for the accreditation and the design of PhD programs uh, in terms of the award of qualifications. So while Deputy Boy Barrett may have a very clear view in relation to funding levels, in relation to programs, we are clear in the law as to where the funding responsibility comes from in terms of the Department of Public Expenditure Reform and indeed this chamber, the Oireachtas, uh, and what the, the role of the HEA, HEA and QQI as well in terms of accreditation and design. So I very much understand the intention, particularly of Amendment 3, but these are matters that wouldn't be within the remit of the new agency, and therefore I don't believe the provision is appropriate for inclusion uh, in the bill. In line with the Universities Act 1997, third-level institutions have, of course, autonomy in relation to human resource policies, subject to compliance with government policy in respect of employment numbers uh, and pay policy. They do require operational freedom and flexibility if they're to deliver on their mission. Uh, the higher education institutions are and must be committed to providing stable and fulfilling employment and career opportunities, and the significant majority of university employment is through full-time and permanent contracts of employment around 83%. However, I am concerned about the issue when it comes to academic precarity. And my department has been leading on a number of initiatives uh, to address these issues, and I did undertake further engagement at committee stage with IFUT in relation to a recent report they brought out about precarious employment uh, in, the third level, uh, in the third level sector. There has been extensive engagement with HEI, staff, representative bodies, and other stakeholders in issues of concern, such as, for example, low pay and short-term contracts. It's not acceptable to me as we increase core funding and as we increase the number of staff that an institution can employ, that that doesn't see a direct benefit in terms of a reduction uh, and ultimately an elimination of precarious um, employment. It's clearly important that we understand the scale of the issue and work has been done in, regard, in this regard with the HEA. Significant additional funding has been invested in higher education through the last budget, the one before it, including some 100 million euro uh, to funding the future policy framework. And this gave an uplift of 1,500 core funded posts under the current employment control framework, which will assist higher education institutions in recruiting more permanent staff and reducing precarious employment. At the same time, we do need to be clear that there are different factors that can give rise to non-permanent staffing arrangements, and there can sometimes, on occasion, be sound reasons as to why a position may not be filled on a permanent basis uh, as well. HR policy in respect to researchers was formalised through, as I said earlier, the Researcher Career Development and Employment Framework, the RCDEF. This did address core issues of disparate and potentially unequal uh, terms and conditions and a lack of defined career paths for researchers that applied across the ecosystem. It has delivered significant benefits for researchers including a clear and uniform salary structure uh, and salary policy as well. But I'm absolutely committed, to be very clear and let the record show, committed to doing much more in relation to improving the financial supports available to PhD researchers, building on the progress that we made in this budget going further uh, in the next one, and crucially publishing the co-chair's final report this month, which does give consideration to a whole range of issues to do with PhD researchers, including their status, uh, and has taken into account, as I said earlier, the perspectives of 35 stakeholder organisations, as well as a variety of international practices in operation across Europe. The only point I will make, uh, just, and I, I welcome your commitment to the European uh, Union and your support for European Commission initiatives in, in in relation to this, that's not lost on me, but we are, we are of the European Union. We are around the decision-making table of the European Union. We have representation in the Commission, in the Parliament, at the Council. 
and I would reject any, any suggestion, if it is being asserted, that we're not following very much the principles set out and indeed the, the laws and guidelines that are set out at a European level. I'm simply making the point as to the appropriateness of what should reside in this bill as to, uh, as to uh, other agencies uh, and institutions. Okay. Uh, the Code of Conduct for the Recruitment of Researchers and the Commission's Recommendations the Charter for Researchers, says, for example, all researchers engaged in a research career should be recognised as professionals and be treated accordingly. They're not. Yeah, they are professionals. That's their point. Are they not professionals? Absolutely. I'm differentiating between the word professionals and employees, but I don't mean to interrupt, sorry. Okay, well, there, I, this, I, I would consider them professionals. They are working, and without our researchers, our third-level institutions wouldn't be able to function. Right? They would not be able to function. But they are not being treated as professionals. Uh, the vast majority of them are living in poverty, and they're not acknowledged for the contribution they make in terms of their employment uh, status and rights. That's the fact. And that's why they're campaigning. And they're looking to be recognised as workers. And they've gone to the trouble of producing a very detailed document. I'm not sure if you've had a chance to read it yet, but it's a very good one. What would you expect from postgraduate researchers except a very forensic and detailed piece of uh, research? Uh, and it clearly demonstrates that we're performing very poorly compared to many if not most, of our European counterparts when it comes to the treatment of uh, our postgraduate researchers uh, in terms of the levels of income and the employment security, the uh, career uh, paths, opportunities, uh, and so on. So we have a long way to go, and I think it is entirely reasonable, therefore, to hardwire that in to the body, the state government set up body that is responsible for funding research. Uh, this issue, I, I very much agree with Deputy Sherlock on the way he put it, um, and, and that's the balance we're trying to get right. What belongs appropriately within the legal remit of a research agency, and what belongs appropriately with independent, autonomous uh, higher education institutions? But to be very clear on this European question, I want to come back to it again. We shouldn't allow the record of Dahl Aaron suggest that there is a uniform approach to the status of PhD researchers uh, across the member states. I mean, there isn't. That's, that would be counterfactual. It's not the position. And when I had very good engagement, and I really did have very good engagement with a number of PhD research groups, they rightly talked, and I agree with them, on the need for us to do more to better support them. That, 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 that bit, I think, is something we can all agree on. And we can, we can disagree perhaps on how to go about it, but we can agree on how important it is to protect and promote talent in our country. But very interestingly, when you ask people to give you examples of which countries they think are the best in class in relation to this, they, those, those different countries they bring forward might have different ways of approaching the issue. So there isn't a uniform one-size-fits-all approach here. What there is, though, quite rightly at a European level, where we're proudly members and sitting around the decision-making table and contributing to the development of these guidelines and others, uh, and at a national level, a need to continue to do more to support researchers. That's why we've increased the stipends in this budget. It's why we've taken a number of steps to equalise levels of stipends between the IRC and SFI over recent years. It's why we intend to go further in relation to the stipend level, and it's why we're going to now publish the final report by the co-chairs. That's been a really extensive process, an exhaustive process in many ways, uh, this month. And it's why I'd be very happy at that stage, once, once I publish it, Las King Corley to either come back to this house or to the Oireachtas Committee and tease through what the next concrete steps we can and should take to better support PhD researchers in Ireland. And I very much look forward to engaging with colleagues on that. Last word. Yeah, uh, just to be clear, I'm not saying they're uniform. And indeed, the Postgraduate Workers Organisation's report shows there are different models. Uh, but what I am quoting is the recommendation that they should be treated as professionals, uh, they should be seen as professionals and treated accordingly. And uh, currently, what I think they would feel, and I think rightly so, is that in many cases they're brutally underpaid, uh, that they're really struggling uh, to sustain themselves in 
uh, the work that they do and in the career that they would like uh, to pursue and indeed are exploited in many cases and taken advantage of. Uh, and you know, some of them were very clear uh, because as you know, so, uh, quite a few of these people would be people from other countries who've come here to do research and a lot of them just saying, I don't know why I came here. Because it's just impossible. Now that's not a good space for us to be in, it seems to me. We want to make this an attractive place for people to do research. Uh, uh, so we have a long way to go uh, to get to the situation where, as it, as it now, we don't have even the living wage uh, guaranteed to people in research uh, or proper employment uh, conditions. And if you're working for four or five years in this, you know, it has consequences that for in, in terms of sort of pension entitlements and other things later in life uh, if you're not treated as an employee. And their preferred option, postgraduate workers' organisation, having looked at all the models, looked at the sort of uh, principles set out in Salzburg and in the various things, is the best model is to be treated as an employee. Uh, and that's the one the minister should go for. Uh, but it certainly seems reasonable that the research body should at least be setting out to guarantee decent conditions of employment, uh, income and so on for our researchers. And of course, to Deputy Sherlock, yes, maintain the independence of the institutions, of course. But that doesn't mean we can't have a, a decent floor in terms of conditions of employment.